Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning in America. We're now in the middle of the month of the Cheshvan. We're taught in Sefer Yitzirah that every month is created by a letter, the letters of the alphabet. The 22 letters are divided into three mother letters, seven double letters, and 12 simple letters. Twelve well, simple letters correspond to the twelve months of the year. It begins from Nisan. This is the eighth month, and the letter of this month is Nun. So the topic that we'll discuss today derives of comes out of the uh, of the meaning of this letter Nun. There's another important thing about every month of the year that there is one of the twelve senses of the soul, which is actually the sense of the tribe, of one of the twelve tribes that corresponds to that particular month of the year. And this month the tribe is Minashe and his sense is Reach, smell. But we're taught, and there's an explicit verse in Isaiah, that smell is the special sense of the Mashiach. To the extent that the sages say that the way to know who is the Mashiach is if he can judge and that he's sensitive to everyone, to every individual, by an inner spiritual smell. So if the letter is noon and the sense is smell, what, what is the relation between the two? How do they correspond to one another? So that's by understanding the meaning of the letter noon. And the taught, Rashi brings this in several places in the Tanakh, in the Bible, that the meaning in Hebrew of Nun is king or kingdom. The most important verse is the verse that we'll discuss, which is in chapter 72 of Tehillim of Psalms, which is the chapter that's devoted to King Solomon, but it, it uh, Many of the verses relate explicitly to the Mashiach, to the Messianic figure that we're all expecting speedily in our days. And the most important verse that uh, relates to the Mashiach in this chapter is, in English we'll say it, may his name be forever. Before the sun his name is Yinon. This is the one word that we'll say in, in Hebrew. And that this is a verse that actually says, what is the name of the Messiah? And it says that the name of the Messiah is Yinon, from the, from the simple letter Nun. And that Nun is the name of the Mashiach, of the Messiah. It says that all peoples on earth will be blessed by him, just like when Abraham was first instructed by Hashem, by God, to leave his uh, homeland, his initial homeland, and to come to Israel. So he said, the Yed you should be blessing, that all peoples on earth will be blessed by you. So just like the first Jew is a source of blessing for all peoples on earth, so the Messiah is the source of blessing for all peoples on earth. Kol Goim Yashu, that's the end of the verse, that all of the peoples, all of the nations will praise you, will be happy with you. So this is the verse that we see, and once more Rashi explains that Nun means king. You might expect that the month that uh, corresponds to the kingdom, not just expect, the, the, the truth certainly is that the, uh, the month that explicitly corresponds to the kingdom is the first month of the year, 
which is Nisan. But let's, uh, let's take note of the fact that Nisan, as is explained by the sages, and especially in Hasidut, begins and ends with this letter Nun. It's like an expansion of the letter Nun. Nisan is the month of Judah. Judah is the kingly tribe. So there's a lot of uh, relation kingship in Nisan. So what can be then the difference between the kingship of Nisan and the kingdom of this month of Cheshavan? In Cheshavan, the nun appears at the end of the name of the month. Nisan is both the beginning and the end, the nun of kingdom. So the explanation is that Nisan is the, is the outer appearance or dimension of the king. But the inner soul, just like the word reyach, smell, is the same two-letter root as ruach, as spirit. And that the spiritual dimension of the Mashiach is actually this month, this month of Cheshvan. The physical, the more physical aspect, the outer aspect of the presence of the king is Judah, coming from the tribe of Judah, is the month of Nisan. So that's just in order that we begin to appreciate the messianic power of this month. It's the spiritual dimension of the Messiah. So what we're now going to devote ourselves to is to speak about kings, the very concept of kingship, where it begins in the Torah. Who was the first king in the history of mankind? And what can we learn from that fact? Because the expression in Hebrew, that everything depends and is based upon the first appearance, whether it's a word or a concept, of a story, the first appearance of something in history is the is the basis of all similar events or, uh, or parallel concepts that will appear in the continuation of history. So kingship, kingdom, definitely begins from some place, from some point. As Adam was not yet a king. Neither were the son of Shet a king, nor his grandson Enosh a king. Who was the first king? How many generations do we have to wait from the creation of Adam, the first man, until we reach the first king? So the answer to that question is that we have to wait 13 generations. 13 generations means three generations after Noah. Noah is the tenth generation of mankind. He has three sons. One of the sons is Ham. Ham has a son whose name is Kush. Kush is Ethiopia. And Kush has a son whose name is Nimrod. And Nimrod is the first king of history as recorded in the Torah. So if kingship begins with Nimrod, we have to try to study and understand his soul. As he was not a tzaddik, he was a rasha. He was a, a wicked person. One of the most uh, famous things we know about him is that he through Abraham, the first Jew, the first patriarch, the first father into the furnace because of his faith in one God, because he broke the idols of his father's uh, idol store. And Abraham was saved, came out miraculously. But there are other things that Nemo did the most universal thing that he is responsible for, the first king, is the Tower of Babel. And the whole story of the Tower of Babel in the Torah, which is the end of the second portion of the Torah, the portion of Noah. But he was the king that was in charge of 
building that city, which afterwards became the, the city, the capital of Babel, Babylonia. That's the name of the city as well. And he is the king of Babylonia. And so everything about Babylonia, about Babel, is, comes from him, from Nimrod. Meaning that even good things that were derived, like Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, which is the Talmud by which we, to this very day, decide the law of the Torah and our way of life, our Jewish life. Not according to the Talmud Yerushalmi, but rather according to the Talmud Bavli. So to this very day, there's something very, very basic and fundamental in the Judaism about Babylonia. Babylonia begins from the Tower of Babel story. And once more, the king is named there in that is not explicit, but it's very clear to the sages that since in a previous verse in Noah it says that that he was the king of Babylonia. It says that explicitly. So it's very clear that he was in charge of this uh, story of building the city and erecting the tower. What else do we know in Kabbalah about uh, Nimrod? Well, the first thing that we now uh, should already ha have been clear is that his name begins with the letter Nun, which is where we're coming from. That Nun is this month of uh, Cheshvan, and Nun means king. That's the meaning of the word. talking about the noon, so our last class a month ago was about Yonah, about Jonah, that he was swallowed up by a, a giant fish. In Aramaic, noon, the very same letter noon, means fish. So in Hebrew, it means king, and in Aramaic, it means uh, fish. What can be the relation? So maybe the king the king that we're waiting for, we're expecting the Mashiach, maybe he'll also be a giant fish. Maybe he'll be the, the Leviathan, the Leviathan. The very word Leviathan, the Leviathan actually equals Malchut. This goes very well with what we just explained a moment ago, that the noon of this month is the spiritual the most spiritual dimension, the inner dimension of the Messiah, of the king, of the king figure. Because the fish is called the, the creature of the alma Kasi, of the concealed world of the sea. So obviously Mashiach also must have a land aspect to himself. And he must have a sea aspect to himself. So Nun, as king, since in Aramaic it means fish, it must be the inner, concealed, like the concealed reality or world of the king, king of the Messiah. <laughs> So, the greatest of the Mekubalim of the Kabbalist teaches us that Nimrod came back in a second lifetime, was reincarnated, and who did he become? He became Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylonia, just like Nimrod. And Nebuchadnezzar, as we probably all know, is the king that destroyed the first temple built by Solomon. Now Nebuchadnezzar actually has even two nuns in his name. He begins with a nun, 
And the name is actually divided as explained explicitly. It has two meanings to it. Nebuchad is one word, and Netzar is another word. Netzar means a, a ruler, a Caesar, a king. So both of the words that compose his name begin with a nun. And he is the reincarnation, the Gilgul of the Nimrod. In the Gemara we even find that he is an actual descendant of Nimrod. But there's another amazing thing it says in the Gemara and the Talmud. Our Talmud Babli, our Babylonian Talmud, that, uh, that he's actually also a descendant of King Solomon who built the temple that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed. How so? How can he be a descendant, an actual physical descendant of King Solomon? Because we probably all remember the story of King Solomon marrying the Queen of Sheba. It doesn't actually say explicitly in the Tanakh that he married her, but when we learn the verses correctly, it's concealed there that he actually had relations with her. That was her request, her final request, after she was so tremendously impressed by the wisdom of Sodom. She asked for something, and her request was to have a child from, from King Solomon. And he converted her, the Queen of Sheba. And either the child was Nebuchadnezzar himself, or he was a descendant of that child. Once so, the descendant of the king who built the temple, he was the one to destroy the temple. Yeah. In Kohelet, it says, one happening happens to the good man and to the bad man. And the sages say that that is referring or comparing Solomon to Nebuchadnezzar. That Solomon was a king for 40 years. He reigned for 40 years. And he built the temple. And the Bukhadnezer also reigned exactly for 40 years and he destroyed the temple. So about that, Solomon in his book of wisdom, which is Kohelet, Ecclesiastics, he says, as in prophecy of what will be, that one happening happens to both. What happens to me, that I built the temple, is exactly what's going to happen I mean, the 40 years of reign is going to happen to my descendant, actually my physical descendant, who destroyed the, who shall destroy the temple. Is there another uh, important king, Gentile king, whose name also begins with a nun? Then we'll have three. If we have three, then we have a chazoko. That very important kings, Chazoka means it, it's a hold, that the, like a, a sign of uh, correctness or truth. The first king of history is Nimrod. He then comes back as Nebuchadnezzar. Who can think of another king that comes back? Also beginning with the noon. Who 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 was the one that, that destroyed the second temple? Or responsible for destroying the second temple? who destroyed the first temple. Nero, Nero, Nero Keso. In general, a, na- a proper name beginning with the nun is a relatively rare phenomenon in Hebrew, in the Torah. So we have these three kings. You know, the one that wanted to kill Abraham, that built the, that 
built the uh, city and the Tower of Babel, and then the Bukhadnezzar, and then Niron Kesar. In voyage of literature and thought, the non-Jewish uh, thought, so uh, there's a most famous, it's probably the most famous Geomatria from a non-Jewish source, 666, which for the non-Jews, or for many non-Jews, is a number which is a very frightening number, because it represents the anti-Messiah. What does it equal? Why, do, why is this number picked? Because it equals, if the two words are written in the minimal spelling form, Niron Kesar, Nero the, the Caesar. He is considered in non-Jewish culture to be the anti-Messiah. To the extent that they believe that he's going to come back <laughs> reappear to fight the Messiah. What about the Talmud, our Talmud Bavli, our, our true Jewish tradition? What do we have to say about Niron, Niron Kesa? So that sages teach that secretly, at the very, very end of his life, he converted to Judaism. And his descendant, who is his descendant, whoever remembers, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir Balanes. Of all of the Tanaim, the sages of the, of the period of the Mishnah, Rabbi Meir is the only one that alludes to himself as being a pot the potential Messiah. That's so the most, of the, in, in, in effect, the only messianic figure of the period of the Mishnah is Reb Meir. And he is not himself a convert, but he comes from converts that we know explicitly. And the sages teach us that he comes from, from Nero, Niron Kisa who converted. There's a whole story in the Talmud of what brought him to conversion at the very end of his, of his life. According to non-Jewish uh, Roman history, he committed suicide at a very young age. But according to other, say, Goyesha traditions, he just disappeared. So there even Goyim non Jews that believes that he never died even. He's just always around as the anti the anti of their Messiah. But for us he is the he becomes a, a righteous convert and a, a father of the Messiah of who's going to be the Messiah. So this is a very amazing line of lineage. What about Nebuchadnezzar? Does he also have a tikkun? Well, according to Chazal, Nero, Nero has a tikkun of rectification. What about the previous two? The point that we're trying, we'll say the, actually the, should be the title of today's uh, talk that we're talking, is that the most wicked kings of history, those that are responsible for destruction of the, of the temple and of Jewish uh, culture and values, and just the killing, the mass murder of millions of Jews. Have a tikkun. Not only do they have a tikkun, a rectification, 
But they have spark, they have messianic spark. These wicked people, they have messianic sparks which have to be redeemed. And when those messianic sparks are redeemed, then the Messiah will really appear, the true Messiah will appear and redeem us. All of this, if we just think about it for a moment, fits in perfectly with the with what we've been talking about for throughout this last year and for previous years of what, what we're calling the fourth revolution, which is teaching Torah to the whole world in order to be able to attract, like a magnet, to attract sparks, lost sparks, that before all of these lost sparks are gathered, are returned and are gathered into, back into Judaism. So the redemption, the final redemption, and Mashiach cannot come, Messiah cannot come. So now we're actually talking about a very, very uh, strong uh, element of that, that according to Kabbalah and even the, the sages in the Talmud itself, all of the most wicked people, it says that their children study Torah, not just Nimrod and uh, and in the Vukhadnetsa, San Khiriv, everyone, there's a whole Sugya uh, portion of the Gemara that says all of the wicked kings that destroyed and killed the Jewish people, Haman, Haman, who wanted to destroy us. But even those that did kill, all of them had children, had descendants that came back to Judaism, that converted and studied Torah. So now it's tell us, we'll tell a story that the Midrash says about Nebuchadnezzar. The story is a story in the period of the Second Temple once a rich man brought an ox, a fat, big ox, to the temple to offer the sacrifice. On his way to the temple, pulling the ox with him, a poor man approached him, and instead of the poor man asking for palms and for charity, the poor man took a, a some some uh, vegetable or grass out of his uh, pocket and gave this vegetable to the ox to eat. So the ox ate the, the vegetable that the poor man gave and as, as soon as the ox ate this vegetable he sneezed caused him to sneeze. And when the ox sneezed after eating this vegetable, so he sneezed out of his nose a needle, a pin, which had that needle remained in his lungs, he would be trafe, he would be unworthy and disqualified to be a, to be a sacrifice. They just tell the story that when the, uh, the rich man was, uh, was pulling his ox to the, to the temple, so the ox didn't follow, didn't want to go. He was, was fighting against the, uh, his owner. But as soon as he sneezed out the, uh, the needle, so he went he just went on his own the ox went on his own and went to the was taken to the, to the temple and was sacrificed in the temple that very night the rich man had a dream and the 
dream that he had was that you should know that the sacrifice of the poor man was greater than your sacrifice. What was the sacrifice of the poor man? The sacrifice of the poor man was the, that grass that he gave him to eat. The grass that he gave the ox to eat in the dream was called a sacrifice. And that sacrifice was greater than, you, than the ox itself that you then afterwards took, or the ox went on its own to, to the temple. So how does the Arizal now, this is the, this is the story in the Midrash. How is it explained? Who is the ox? Who is the poor man? What is the needle? Even the needle has a meaning. The needle is also a reincarnation of something. Rizal explains that no other than Nebuchadnezzar himself is the ox. Before we said that Nebuchadnezzar was, was a descendant of King Solomon from the Queen of Sheba. He is the only king in the Bible that is called King of Kings, Melech Malchaya. He is also called in the Bible, my servant, God. Hashem says that he is my servant. In destroying the temple, he is my servant. In a later moment in history, when there were also martyrs, like Hananiah, Mishael, and Nazar, the three that, uh, that also were thrown into the furnace by him, by Nebuchadnezzar, but also came out alive, just like Abraham came, came out alive from being thrown into the furnace by Nimrod, the previous incarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. In the second temple period, one of the kings of Rome also killed, as we know, there were many martyrs. And once, one of the kings said that uh, if you Jews, if you sages that are not going to be also burnt at the stake, if you're as righteous as your predecessors, predecessors which are Hanani, Mishon, Nazaria, why doesn't God make a miracle for you to come out of the furnace just like he made a miracle for them. So what did they answer him? They answered him that Nebuchadnezzar that threw Hananiah, Mishol, and Nazar into the furnace was worthy of God making a miracle for his, to his eyes. But you are not worthy. There is something very, very worthy about Nebuchadnezzar. That he deserves, he earns that a miracle, a tremendously supernatural miracle of Jewish righteous sages being saved from the fire should happen, meaning that a miracle is not just due to the righteousness of the, of the Jew, whoever it happens to be, the righteousness of the tzaddik, it also depends on the righteousness of the wicked person who also has some spark of righteousness that makes him worthy of this miracle happening before his eyes, to his eyes. Because he then becomes a source of Kiddush Hashem. The wicked person himself becomes a source of sanctifying Hashem's name. And they said that you, the king in, this, in the, the later period, are not worthy of God's name being sanctified through you. So we're going to have to die at the stake because you, the Goyesh king, are not worthy of a miracle happening. But Nebuchadnezzar was. So all of these things point at the fact that he had some uh, school, he had some merit. 
What was the merit? At a certain point, Daniel, who is his viceroy of Nebuchadnezzar, he also, first of all, he merited to have a tremendous, tremendously great viceroy. Daniel gave him a, a uh, advice that to save himself or to atone for his sin, the things that can atone for all of your sins, he said to Nebuchadnezzar, is to give charity. That's a very important verse that's even brought in Tanya for, for us, for all people, for all Jews, that the most all-inclusive atonement for sin is charity. Who, where do we learn that from? That's the advice that Daniel gave to Nebuchadnezzar. How was he allowed to give such advice in general to, to give advice to a non-Jew to atone for his sins is not a recommended uh, thing. How did Daniel do it? So it says, once more the sages teach us that the, the, the state of the Jews in exile in Babylonia was so severe that there were Jewish people dying every day from famine. And because Daniel saw this death of his brethren who were dying day by day, so he actually went against the normal instruction and revealed this secret, so to speak, to Nebuchadnezzar, that if you want to atone for your sins, the way to atone for your sins is by giving charity. So he did, he gave charity, and he, by his charity, saved the lives of hundreds and thousands, maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Jewish people. The charity of, of Nebuchadnezzar. That was his, so on the one hand he killed millions, on the other hand, through his charity, he saved and enlivened millions. Who was that uh, poor man that pulled the grass out of his pocket to give it to the ox? It says that that poor man was the, f the first Jew that was about to die by famine had not Nebuchadnezzar given charity to him. So in response, which is called Hakarat HaTov, since Nebuchadnezzar saved his life of this Jew, of this poor Jew, so now they came back to, to make this ox worthy of being a sacrifice in the temple. What is the meaning of the needle? He said that even the needle has, has significance and is a reincarnation of something. Yurizal says that the machat, the needle, are all of his, all of the heresy all of his thoughts and opinions and philosophy which is against the truth of the Torah beginning from the fact that he himself made himself made himself God and he created a tzelem an idol to worship himself all of his heretical thoughts came back as a needle. What, what can we learn from this? We can learn that actually all disease says that there are 70 different trefot, 70 different diseases which are fatal, mortal diseases, which correspond to the 70 nations of the earth. Which has taught in the Kutei Muaran correspond to the seven languages, languages of the of the seventy nations.
with those 70 languages began from the story of the Tower of Babel that we're going to have to go back to in a moment. What's bad about the... The only thing that is bad is the, is the belief system. That's why our fourth revolution is to is to bring true a true belief system to all peoples on earth. Once more, we have nothing against anybody. Every goy, every non-Jew, Gentile can become a righteous convert. Maybe maybe he's more related to the Messiah even than than a born Jew. So what's wrong? What's what's the problem? The problem is only the belief system, which gives rise to all of the other uh, bad attributes of the heart. The one who makes this the most, most explains this more clearly than anyone else is Maimonides. That the whole Torah is simply to negate wrong belief systems. And every one of the peoples on earth has some wrong belief system with a needle in his lungs, a source of disease, a source of mortal disease. Meaning that if belief is correct, we're all cured 100% well. And disease is all coming from some wrong belief. There's a tremendous uh, fundamental idea to, to, under, to understand and integrate. So once more, the, uh, the poor man was that uh, the first one that he saved by giving staka. And now, after the needle was, he sneezed out his needle. Once more, what does it mean that he sneezed out his needle? That he sneezed out all of his false beliefs, beginning with the fact that he made himself God. So then he was ready willfully to sacrifice himself. He, he now believed in one God. So that ox now actually is in a, in a process of conversion. We have to teach Torah to the nations. The poor man, how did he convert the ox? By simply giving him the right grass to eat. The right grass to eat it makes him sneeze and then he sneezes out all of his false beliefs and he, and he converts and now that he believes in one God he, he knows that he has to atone for all of those millions of people that he killed and the temple that he destroyed so how is he going to atone for all of that by, being a, by giving up his life by being a sacrifice that's why willfully he ran to the temple to sacrifice himself and self-sacrifice. This is one, uh, an amazing story with the interpretation of the of the Ariza. There's a a saying of the sages at the end of the tractate of Brachot of blessings that says that there are three things that we have to ask mercy for. In Hebrew the words are shlosha tzrichim lachamim. Three things that everyone should ask mercy for. The first is melech tov. A good king we should have a good king. A good king means to ask mercy from God that we should merit to a good government. Mm -hmm. A good governor, a good government. 
The second thing is Shana Tova. A good year. What does it mean a good year? A good year is a prosperous year. A year of, of rain. Rain is Gashmiut. means prosperity, physical prosperity. And the third thing is a good dream. Chalom Tov. That's what Hazal say. We should ask every day mercy from God. Shloshat Shlichim Rachamim for three things. Melech Tov, Shana Tova, Chalom Tov. So first of all, we see that the very first thing to ask mercy for is a good king. But since the good king goes together with a good year, and a good dream, so there must be a relation between these three. Obviously, if the Chazal put them, if the sages put the three together, they must be very closely related. So first, let's, let's contemplate the, the, the acronym that they form, which means the initial letters of these three things in the order that Chazal say. King, year, dream. They all go together, even before we'll, we'll say what the acronym is, we'll say that probably the dream comes back to the king. To ask for a good uh, king, we have to have a good dream of who that good king can be. Because that good king is not so uh, presently recognized and I identified in the reality as we, as we know it. We have to have a dream. In order to reach that dream of the good king, it has to be a good year. It has to be prosperity. In any event, what are the initial letters? What does it spell? Melech, Shana, Chalom, King, Year, Dream. It spells Mashach, to anoint, the root of Mashiach. So this, this uh, saying of the sages is a very messianic sage. Saying... Always have in mind and ask for these three things. And all of them are good. The adjective here and each one is good. A good king. Each one has a verse in the Bible that, that the sages derive from that verse. A good king, a good year, and a good dream. Let's go one step further. We'll calculate the geomatia, the numerical value of the three words. King. King is 90, Melech. Then Shana, year, is 355, Shin Nun Hei, Shana. Then Chalom, Chalom, dream, is 84. So let's add those three numbers together. It's 529. 529 is a very, very important number. First of all, it's a complete number, a consummate number. This is a perfect square. It's 23 squared. And the most important word in, in the Torah that it equals in Hebrew is Ta'anuk, pleasure. There's nothing better en betovada malami onik mi Ta'anuk. means that the ultimate or infinite pleasure of life is these three good things. A good king, and a good year, and a good dream. What else can these correspond to? We'll go back to our basic text of, uh, of Kabbalah and also of Hebrew grammar, which is the Book of Formation, Sefer Yitzhira. There it says that all of reality God created in three dimensions, three general dimensions which are called Olam, Shana, Nefesh, world, year, and soul. So it's very clear that the, that the year is the year, because it's exactly the same word. And it's also the second of the three in the order that, that the sages uh, quote. It's also very clear that the last, the, the dream, corresponds to soul. Because the dream is the manifestation, the reflection of the subconscious. 
which is the soul. All of psychoanalysis is based upon dreams. Because the dream reveals the soul. So it's very clear that a good dream is the dimension of soul. And that the good year is the dimension of time. The time coordinate. So what does that mean? It means that a, a king, the good king must be at the dimension of world. World which means space in general. But also world in the sense that we, that we speak of world. The world, the universe. The whole world. When we refer to Hashem, we call Hashem Medachod, I'm the king of the world. So we see that king goes together with world. Every blessing that we make, we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed be you Hashem, our God, who is the king of the world. So first we have to ask for a good king in order to rectify the world dimension of reality. And then for a good year to rectify the time, the year dimension of reality. And then for a good dream to rectify the soul dimension of reality. But as we're now explaining, all of the the whole concept of a kingship, the beginning, begins from a bad king, from Nimrod. classic example of Beresha Chashocha Vahadan Ora that there are certain concepts concepts that come from what's called the primordial world of chaos that breaks that we then are created to rectify we're here down here on earth to rectify the breaking of the vessels and there are many many concepts which derive their origin is in the world of chaos and that's why the first time that they appear in the Torah is in a negative context and then it's our duty, our task to, to re- revert and to rectify to bring them into a positive light a positive context and one of the most important of such words and concepts is king because once more king begins with Nimrod he's the first king in the Torah. Reshit Mamlakto Bavel. And it says that his kingdom is Babylonia. When you take his name Nimrod and, and, uh, and add it to Bavel, the result is Choshech, darkness. So we'll now conclude we're trying to, to round up, up until here. What can we learn about his name? He said that the name begins with a nun. But what does the name mean? Well, the first king was the king of darkness in Babylonia. What does his name mean? So the simple meaning of Nimrod means to rebel. Rebellion, revolution. And the sages themselves say, interpret it in this way. Sages say that why is his name Nimo? That the, most part, the first king is a rebel. He's a negative rebel. He caused all of humanity to rebel against God. That's what the sages say about Nimo. Much more, the root in Hebrew of rebellion or revolution is merit. And Nimrod means we shall rebel or let us rebel. I mean, actually, he's turning the noon there is the plural, the plural of we, Nimrod. He's addressing all of mankind and saying to mankind, let us rebel. This is the simple meaning of Nimrod. Who is he rebelling against? He's rebelling against God. 
but but what specific aspect of, of kedusha of sanctity is rebelling against? Since he is represents darkness. Before we said that everything depends on the needle. The needle is the heretical thoughts or the mistaken belief system that one may possess. He also made himself a god, Nimrod, not just Nebuchadnezzar, his follower. And once more, he could not tolerate Abraham, who broke the idols of his father. In one place in Chazal it says that at that very moment that Abraham came out alive from the furnace that he th threw him to the furnace, he had a hirhur tshuva. He nimrod himself. That hirhur tshuva means he had a thought of repentance and return. That he realized that he's wrong and that Abraham is right. But it didn't last so long. But that was his spark. But he also he has a spark, he even has a messianic spark to him. Because afterwards, he came back to create the pact of the four kings against the five kings. Those ulterior ulterior motivation was also to overcome the influence of Abraham in the land of Canaan, of Canaan, as the sages teach. So he came back from a different angle in a different way also to oppose Abraham, the story of the four kings. He is the first one, Amraphel. He has another name there instead of Nimrod, he's called Amraphel. What does it mean, Amraphel? Amarpul. He said to Abraham, fall into the fire. It means that he thrust him into the fire. Amraphel, Medach Shina, Shina is Babylonia. Once more, first he's called, his proper name is Nimrod, but in this particular context of the four kings, he is called Amraphel. So he has the story of throwing Abraham into the furnace, building the city of Babylonia and the Tower of Babel, and then afterwards creating the pact of the four kings that Abraham defeated ultimately. Is there another meaning to his name besides we shall rebel? First, first of all, it's very important here, the Nun, that we see that since the Nun is the letter of the king, in this context we see that the Nun is a, a letter of appeal to the public. The significance of the Nun, the first letter of his name, is he's turning, appealing, or, or arousing the public it's influencing public opinion through the media, obviously. Nun must be a, a very, very proficient media expert. That he knows how to turn to the public and arouse the public to rebel against something that he wants to rebel against. Nimrod. Well, this is the, the pshat, the simple meaning of Nimrod. What else can the mode mean? If we just take the first three letters, the mem raised out of the last three letters, then it means we shall rebel. But if we just take the first three letters, it spells what? It spells the name of an animal. And in one place it says that this is the meaning of his name. What is that animal? Namel, a leopard or a tiger. The very first instruction that we're taught in the ethics of the fathers to to uh, to emulate the power of an animal in the service of our Father in heaven is Hebei Askenamer. This also taken to be the first halacha in the Shulchan Aruch to be as bold as a tiger. But a 
tiger is an impure strafe, it's an impure, pure animal. But there's something so important about the tiger that that's the first Jewish law to become a tiger. So if Nimrod has this tiger, the first three letters of his name, what does the Dalit represent? The last letter. If the root is Merit, then the Nun is the We. We shall rebel. But if the root is Namer, which means a tiger, what is the Dalit? So in the Torah, Nimrod is written always Chaser, without a vav, just Nun, Mem, Reish, Dalit. But in Chronicles, which as we probably know, spells words in, in full, not as in the Torah. So Nimrod is written with a, a vav and a Dalit at the end. Nun, Mem, Reish, Vav, Dalit. If we take the Dalit of the Torah and the Vav Dalit of Chronicles and put it together, what does it become? It becomes David. Nimrod is David's tiger. The tiger of David. The king of him. David is usually compared to a lion. Nebuchadnezzar the reincarnation of Nimrod, it says that he actually rode on a lion and had a, 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 a tanin, a crocodile, around his head. Nimrod is called a gibor tzayid, he was a hunter. Ibn Ezra, one of the, the, maybe the commentary, which is the most literal interpretation, says that his rule was first to rule over the animal kingdom. And by ruling over animals with success, that's the way he, be he became acknowledged by people to have him rule over people. By first proving his force his ability to rule over animals. It's also a very deep thing about the kingdom, where kingdom begins from. Is there another way to interpret uh, to interpret the mode? Let's put his name into two, four letters. Nun Mem and Reish Dalit. Nun Mem Nam is from the word Nuum, which means to speak. And Reish Dalit is the root in Hebrew, which means to rule. So in a certain way, and this is maybe the most important analysis of the name Nimrod, because he is the first king, and one of the synonyms for kingdom in Hebrew is Rodeh. About Solomon, about King Solomon that we mentioned, one of the words for his kingdom is Rodeh which means to rule. Those are the two last letters of his name. And the first two letters mean to speak. So what is the relation between speaking and ruling? A very important verse says, Ba'asher dvar melech shilton, that a king rules by his word. But those, what's about, nam, rad, is read ruling by word. The saying of the sages that the king says and a mountain is uprooted just by the, by the power of his word. But those same two letters, nam, in addition to meaning speech, also means slumber, to fall asleep. And those two letters, rod, which means to rule, also means to decline, to descend. And in the beginning of the Torah says, Redu, if you're worthy, you will rule. If you're not worthy, this is us. God says to Adam, if you rule, you will rule. If you're not worthy, you will descend, decline. The same is true about Nimrod. If he's worthy, the Namrod is ruling by speech, by the power of the word. If he's unworthy, 
it's falling into slumber, which much more is descending and falling into the abyss of darkness. We said that Nemo plus Bavel Babylonia equals Choshech. The world was dark in the beginning, and then came the light. Who was the light? The light is Abraham. So again, we're, I'm being told here that I have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But we didn't yet reach the real light. Maybe somebody will ask, we have a good experience in the past, that, some, that the good questions... We were able to say all the things that we weren't able to say in the class. <laughs> so let's hope that we have now some good questions. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ralph Ginsburg. Okay, the first question is from Angela in Rock Island, Washington. And I'm reading it exactly. Ginsburg, are you saying that these wicked kings of the past all have a tikkun? and come to assist the Mashiach rise to his place. That's a very well stated uh, synopsis of what we said. <laughs> Obviously a tikkun takes, uh, takes a long time, takes years and years and uh, generations and generations. But all of these, all of these bad uh, people in the Torah have a tikkun, and the kings, especially the kings, and especially these noon kings, are all related to uh, to Mashiach in a certain way. Let's uh, just to give one example of how about the Abiyah interprets the reincarnations of kings of, of non-Jewish kings. If the second one, we said that the first of the four kings in the, in the first war, that's why there's the first king of the Torah, there's the first people, there's something we didn't mention, and I'll make an additional comment. The first time the word pe- a king has to have a people. En melech beloam, there's no king without a people. So the first king in the Torah is remote. Where is the first people? The word people, which is am, a very simple word, am. Who is the first people? Where does it appear? The first people is am echad, is the people that built the Tower of Babel. Who is the king? Nimod. So not only is Nimod the first king, but he is the one who has the first concept of people. Now even more amazing, his name, how, how much does his name equal? Nimrod. Nun Mem Reish Dalet. 294. 294 is a multiple of 14 of David. Before we said that he has a relationship to King, to King David. It's 21 times David, 21 times David, 21 is the uh, God's name, I shall be. It's as though Nimrod is saying, I shall be, I shall become David. Eheyeh pa'amim David, 21 times 40. But what phrase, what most important phrase equals that number 294? Exactly this phrase, which is one of the reasons that the king of all kings, which is God, created the world. Because en melech b'loam, there's no king without a people. That phrase is quoted throughout Kabbalah and also in Sefer Atanya in the book, the classic uh, book of Hasidut, en melech b'loam, there's no king without a people, equals Nimrod. That's the value of his name. So there's an amazing, amazing uh, gemot, that he is the first king and he has the first people, and his name equals there is no king without a people. Where is the first war? The first war is the war of the, of, the, of the four kings against the five kings. That because they took captive Lord, the nephew of Abraham, he entered into the battle to save his nephew. And he defeated the four kings who had defeated and conquered the five kings. The first of which 
use Nimrod himself under the name of Amraphel, and the second of which is Aryoch. Aryoch Melech Alasa. So this is an example to answer the question that was just, or the statement that was stated correctly. The Arizal says that Aryoch, we find that name Aryoch, Aryoch means a long one, but it also means a lion. It means long, like Arich Pin, the long face, the long countenance in Kabbalah. But it also is a word with the means lion, Aryoch, like Aryoch. Who is, where does he come back as this wicked Aryoch? One of the greatest of the Amoraim in the period of the Babylonian, the first generation of the composition of the Babylonian Talmud, his name is Shmuel. And his nickname is Aryoch. What about Melech Elasar? Melech Elasar is his companion. His companion is a Rav. And he is the reincarnation of Melech Elasar. The Arizal says that even though according to the Pshat it's all one person, but it actually comes back as two people. That Aryoch becomes reincarnated as Shmuel, who is called Aryoch in the Talmud, and Melech El Asar, which refers or alludes to the fact that in Isurim, all forbidden things, what is forbidden, what is permissible, the halacha is in accordance with Rav. So Rav is Melech El Asar. So once more, this is a perfect example of a wicked person coming back as the greatest sages in, in, uh, in, in Jewish tradition. But especially the kings that we mentioned, those, those are the ones that come back as, uh, as messianic sparks to assist, as was very well stated in the statement, come back to assist the Messiah. The, the next question, I'm almost trembling to ask it because I knew it was inevitable. <clears throat> I myself would not have the chutzpah to ask it, but since someone did, it, it really <laughs> should be addressed, is, can you please explain, I don't even want to say his name, Yamach Shema, hmm. as another horrible person who tried to eliminate the Jews, where is his mitzitzot and where is his tikkun? I guess I... I I thought of it, I knew it was inevitable, but I, I couldn't get myself to ask him. He's not as we said, the things take many generations until they, uh, something works out. There are souls that say, I have to be in the, in the afterlife, in the opposite of the paradise. For, uh, for thousands of jubilees before their ultimate tikkun becomes consummate. And, uh, and of course it's not mentioned in regarding to the person that was just uh, re referred to because he doesn't appear expl himself as explicit in the in the sources. Usually he is most is considered to be closest to the Haman figure. And Haman we see explicitly uh, Haman says that his uh, his descendants studied Torah in Bnei Brak. The difference of course is that Haman was not successful in his plot to destroy the Jewish people. But this uh, person was uh, partially successful from his uh, point of view. At the end, he, uh, he committed suicide himself. And uh, just like the whole uh, subject of the Holocaust is something which is beyond our comprehension. 
the Rebbe teaches us. And one reason that's beyond our comprehension is that uh, we're still too close to it. As the Rebbe didn't say, I'm just adding that. That when you're close to something, you can't uh, comprehend it. So there's no way to come to talk about the Holy, the Holy Ghost. Certainly no way to talk about the, the one that's responsible for the Holy Ghost. Okay, before we go on, so I did have a question. Mm -hmm. I just want, I didn't have the nerve to ask that one. But there are, there are various traditions that the Baal Shem Tov attempted to rectify or raise the sparks of Shabbat Hatsvi. But he was not, it was, it was even beyond, beyond him. Could, could you comment on that? Is there a tradition of what that whole episode was about and where the possible teaching could be? Well, the year before the Baal Shemta passed away, he, he uh, together with other great uh, rabbin, rabbinical sages of his time, uh, has communicated uh, Jacob Frank, Jacob Frank, and his uh, all of his followers, which were thousands of people. The Shabbat he converted to Islam at the end. And Frank was his follower in a certain way. He began by being a follower of the Shabbat So he had all of his followers convert to the other religion. When the Baal Shem Tov uh, signed the excommunication together with the other rabbis, so he, he cried very deeply and he said that it's, it's like... Uh, Taking a limb off the body, yeah. What's the word in English? Am amputating. Amputating. It's amputating a, a limb from the Jewish from the Jewish people. And he he didn't live to the next year. That day was supposed to have been a holiday. Actually, the other rabbis wanted to celebrate that day every year that the that the Jacob Frank uh, movement had been uh, removed from the Jewish people. But uh, because uh, the Baal Shem Tov, it, it, it happened in Tammuz, the mother Tammuz. But the Baal Shem Tov passed away on Chag Shavuot of the following year, which was a month before. So because of that, it was not, it didn't become a day of celebration. In any event, that's the, uh, the Baal Shem Tov definitely, had he been able to elevate these sparks, he would have done so. His great-grandson, Rabbi Nachman, was also tried to elevate the sparks of the other religion. That's why many of the greats, of his great uh, sages of his time, the rabbis, the great rabbis of his time, were so uh, against Rabbi Nachman and Bresa, because they say he's... he's uh, He's taking uh, and doing um, customs and taking things from from the other religion in order to try in order to elevate the founder of the other religion. So that was so in a certain way, Rabbi Nachman was actually more than the Baal Shem Tov, more than his great grandfather, and in, uh, in attempting to to bring people of the past back. And to uh, to rectify them. Okay, we'll take one more question from outside, and then we'll take questions from here. This is from Ruth Boyko in Port. Anyway, she says near the city of Los Angeles. Can you explain the real light that you were about to explain to us before you have to stop your class? <laughs> That's the greatest question, yes you go. <laughs> you got your wish. <laughs> she gets a book for free. <laughs> <laughs> if 
First of all, let's go back to the to the gematria of uh, of Ein Medach Beloam. There's no there's no king without a people. That he goes Nimrod. He said that he's the first king, and his people is the first people in the Torah. What does people stand for? There's, in the past, we've had many, many classes about, based upon this phrase, there's no king without a people. And we say that since this word people, am, is such a simple word, I and men, that it, it probably stands for different things. So actually we have a whole list of maybe hundreds of different things in the Torah that I and mem stand for. I mean, the initial letter is an acronym for, for two things that go together and relate to kingship. But in the context that we're now studying, the most important thing, the most explicit thing in the Torah is that in the story of the Tower of Babel, it says the people came and said, Nivne Ir Umigda. We shall build, construct a city and a tower. According to the Arizo once more, he said the city is Malchut, his kingdom, and the tower is Yesod. The sphere of Yesod a foundation which is the masculine limb that unites with the feminine kingdom. Just that they're doing it in the context of the other side. So once more, they, the, the word Am is mentioned here for the first time in the Torah. And the Torah makes it very clear what this word stands for. Because it stands for Ir Migdal, City Tower, Malchut Yisod and Tavada. What is the rectification of the city and the tower? The rectification, which is the rectification of the people, it's, we're, we're right here now, we're in the holy city of Jerusalem, Yerushalayim. The city is Yerushalayim, and the tower, what is the tower? The tower is the Beit HaMikdash. It's very important that every day that we pray so much for the building of the Beit HaMikdash, it's good and important to know that the Beit HaMikdash is the rectification, is the holy expression and manifestation of the, of the Tower of Babel. We're called ear, and together the city and the tower in the middle of the city that creates the identity of the people. That's what the people, as a people, the arm depends on the city and the tower, and there is no king. In order to be a king, you have to have a city and a tower. Because the city and the tower is the definition, the identity of the people. This is one important thing that we didn't get to explain. But the, the real thing is about the fact that the simple meaning of Nimrod is to rebel. We shall rebel. We once mentioned that the greatest uh, political philosopher of modern times, his name is John Locke, that all of the, the American Constitution, all of the democratic, democratic Constitution are based upon his philosophy. So one of his most important tenets is, he calls it, the right of rebellion, or the right of revolution. We also once mentioned a very, a very uh, important uh, observation that in, if, you, oh, if you open up your Wikipedia in English, you'll find big, long articles about John Locke and the right of revolution. Uh, according to him, it's not just the right of revolution, the right of rebellion, it's the duty of the people to rebel. That's why the people do not just have a right to rebel, but the people have a duty to rebel against a tyrant. 
against a king or a government system which opposes the best interests of the people. Meaning that the people have to possess a conscience that we know that the concept of human rights is the most important uh, thing in the, in the world today. But in general, we think of human rights as being the rights of the individual. It's just like we talk in, a, in, the, in the context of, uh, say, now the Jewish people, in order to prepare ourselves for the coming of the redemption of Messiah, we have to do tshuva, have to return to God. But there's the return of the individual. But now we say that, that what's missing, what's lacking, is, is not the, the consciousness of an individual returning. There has to be a consciousness of people as us, as a people returning. To God, and as a people return to God means that it's a demand for the for the government to return to God. An individual returning to God is not a demand for the government to return to God. There still can be a distinction between state and religion, but for the people to return, but for the people to return to God is just like this one of all what's called human rights. All human rights are individual, but there's one human right which is not individual. It's a collective right. So this is very, very basic. That of all of the human rights, which are to, to keep the right of the individual, perhaps the most important right is not the right of the individual, it's the right of the community. It's a communal right, the collective right to rebel against a bad, to rebel against Nimrod, to rebel against he who rebels against God. When we speak of this, uh, of this concept, we quote always from the Rebbe that, that now in modern Hebrew, in modern Israel, since the uh, many, many secular Israelis like to, uh, to identify with the pre-Jewish things, whether it's Canaanite figures or other pre-non-Jewish figures, so many parents call their child Nimrod. How can that possibly be to call a child named Lord after uh, this wicked king who uh, once more built the Tower of Babel through Abraham into the furnace and then would be, be, uh, created the, the, the pact of the four kings? So once the... Uh, so many people, many ch children that are named Nimrod, when they grow up and they become Balei Tshuva Baruch Hashem, so they th think that they have to change their name. So once someone by the name of Nimrod asks the Rebbe if he should change his name or not, the Rebbe says no. Nimrod is a great name. Just You have to know who, who you're rebelling against. <laughs> Nimrod names to rebel. That Nimrod brought humankind to rebel against God, but our present Nimrod has to be the John Lux. <laughs> Nimrod, who rebels against against uh, corrupt government and politics, but you're not for the interest of the people. That's what Hamored Machud Chayav Mita. A person that rebels against a king, a good king, is uh, it's a death penalty. So rebellion is a very, very dangerous and bad thing. You, in general, but en klau shen bo there's no general rule that doesn't have an exception to the rule. And definitely there is an exception, which is, once more, this is the basic collective human right, which is called the right to rebel. And what did we say? That if you look up in English, in Wikipedia, right to rebellion, right to revolution, you'll find ton, tons of material. In the Hebrew Wikipedia, you won't find it at all. <laughs> the reason of which is everyone can try to to figure out himself why the Hebrew Wikipedia censors 
the right to rebellion, which is once the the basic collective human right. So much what the question was, where do we find rebellion rebelling against light? There's one verse. This was the basic thing that we wanted to say this in answer to our question. <laughs> There's one verse in Job, in the book of Job, that the verse reads, It's talking about wicked people. It says, they were in the rebels against light. Lo hikirud rachav, they did not recognize his ways. Lo yashfu binetivotav, they did not dwell in his paths. That's the verse. They were of the rebels against light. Who is the light? So, according to most of the classic interpretations, the light is the light of God. And the phrase is Or Haolam, the light of the universe, the light of the world. And there are people that rebel against the light of the world. Let's calculate that phrase. How much is or haolam? It's like a new phrase for most of us. Because we all know that melech haolam, as we said before, God is called the king of the world. But we've never heard of this phrase, that God is called or haolam, the light of the world. From this verse. How much does that phrase equal or Two oh seven and one fifty one. It equals three fifty eight. Three fifty eight is Mashiach. So on the one hand, God is the light of the world, but there is the light of the world that appears to us to our eyes is what we're waiting and praying for which is the appearance of Melech HaMashiach, will be a light. And once more, this is our fourth revolution, a light unto the nations. Now in this, in this verse, they were, Heimahayub they are, Lo Kirud Rachav, they did not know, recognize his ways, neither did they dwell in his paths. There are many, many tremendously beautiful things that hopefully will We'll uh, show them and write them up in in the uh, in the uh, uh, appendixes to this uh, to this class this evening. But the the idea was to come to this first that there are those that rebel against light, and we have to be the ones that rebel against darkness. So we were saying that we have to rebel against the rebels against the. Nimrod is the classic rebel against light. Is he himself, he is darkness. Is there, we said that the classic interpretations say that or and this light and this verse means the light means God, means the light of the world. Is there another interpretation? There are some later interpretations that say that more they are simply people that because they are spiritually sick which is called Marash Chora, the black humor. There are people that cannot live in light. They have to live in the basement. But they can't go outside. They can't see the light of day. They only live in darkness. That's where they think that they're prospering. So those people, that and the, these interpretations, these commentaries say that the meaning here is that they, in the light of day, they're people that they rebel against the light of day. They can only perform in at night. 
So however we interpret it, there are people that rebel against light. And the, what the Rebbe said, to be a good Nimrod, which is a messianic Nimrod, is to also call to society to rebel against darkness. Once more we have to make one more additional saying, that to rebel against darkness can be violent, it can be non-violent. So the Rebbe taught us that our rebellion against darkness, we should do it non-violent. So that's... Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> Um, we're definitely running out of time here. Um, but we have a time for a few more questions. We'll have to keep them brief. But a few, a few announcements that um, people mark your calendars. The next class is the 3rd of December. Hebrew. I'll get the, to that. The 3rd of December, the first Sunday of December. And it's Tet Vav Kislev. Just a few days before you attend the Kislev. We've also been asked to remind everyone of Rav Ginsburg's new book in English. It is not yet available on the, the website, but it will be soon, God willing. It's called The Sparkle in Your Eye. The Twinkle. The Twinkle. The Twinkle in Your Eye. In Your Eye. A book on memory and aging. Uh, it is an excellent, excellent book. But it is available here as we speak. And one last uh, reminder of the WhatsApp where you can get to Ginsburg's daily Divrei Torah. I'll give you the number again. Here in Israel, 050-795-1105. And from outside of Israel, 972 50 795-1105. Okay, a few more questions, and that's all we have time for. Um, Rob, you spoke about the three kings, the negative kings, and the Google of the Nimrod, right? So in our generation, um, it went around, and I think it was accepted how um, Saddam Hussein, much more, he was the Google of Nebuchadnezzar in our generation. He did try to destroy the youth, but he failed miserably in the eyes of the world. It was like a tikkun this and he failed. And how, like, the Rebbe, the Babish Rebbe, preceded the blow that took us before the war was started. And there's this um, conjecture if there was going to be a war or not, a lot of talk. The Rebbe already pulled out since before that there was going to be a war. The war that was written in the al Shimoni, the book of uh, prophecy. And it was going to be this war. And um, there's a lot of details about it. And he also predicted the war would end by firm, which it did. And he also predicted there would be no need for gas masks and war. And uh, very significant year of the year in death the Rebbe speak has about it. And um, I'm interested, uh, how does this all fit in with these bad things and now Okay, that was a very long question. I'll try to summarize it. <laughs> that um, it was commented that there is a call it a modern understanding that uh, Saddam Hussein was a Gilgal of Nebuchadnezzar. He said it about himself. He said himself that he is. He, he said it himself. He said it himself. So I guess that's the proof. And, and either, that the, and that the Rebbe <laughs> um, seemed to have uh, prophesied the war before it happened and that how it would end up and everything. And she's wondering okay. the Rav's comments on this. Okay, so, so it's very clear that when a spark is taken out, it doesn't mean that that, uh, that personality is then uh, annihilated altogether. This is called a berur, a clarification. So uh, everything to be said about taking out positive things from bad people 
doesn't mean that the bad side doesn't also continue to reincarnate. So this is a, we should have said it, we didn't say it, but this is obvious. It doesn't mean that the bad part that remains cannot also reincarnate until eventually either all of the sparks are taken out or, or at a certain point it does just uh, annihilate itself. But the good parts, are, the good sparks are taken out and the bad also continues to, to come back. So the question was, was I guess maybe all of the kings that were mentioned, but specifically Nebuchadnezzar, was he married? And all of the energy that was spoken about in these kings, is there a counterpart for the female? He was married. Even the sages make say what his wife's name, the queen's name. And there are different opinions. One opinion is that her name was Shmira which means to, uh, to guard. And there are other opinions what her name was, but he was definitely married, and so he did have a, a family counterpart. But the most uh, significant thing is we talked about about Niron Kesar, Nero. So this is even in the Goyesha history, in, in simple Roman history, his, he had a wife, his wife. His wife's name was uh, Pophia. It must be exactly the same name as in Roman records. This is the way it appears in the Talmud. And it says that it could very well be that his motivation to convert at the end of Judaism was in a certain extent the result of his wife, because it said that his wife was pro-Jewish. But even in the Roman documents, she was pro-Jewish. Hakominaisha, everything comes from the woman. So even this Jewish queen of Nero Kisal, her, her name equals Yaakov, seven times twenty-six. A very, a very good game out here. She has Pophia. Yes. So I have a question, and hopefully this is a short answer, and maybe it's an interesting question, because we're talking about the four and five kings of Dalai, after the Malkin Sedeq comes out and greets Solomon. Right. And according to Rashi, he says that this is Chen and Noah, who is the footing of the 11th generation. But we said the first king mentioned the Torah is the 13th, so what does the Rav have to say about that? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, the question, we need a clarification <laughs> as to... Um, how Nimrod ends up being the 13th generation if Shem ben Noah is the 11th. Shem, Shem is, the, is one of the three sons of Noah, but Nimrod doesn't come from Shem. Nimrod comes from Ham. He's the 13th generation of Adam because Noah, his son, is Ham, and then Cush, and then Nimrod. Shem is the 11th generation, and Abraham, they're all living at the same time. Abraham is the 20th generation. So you have Shem, Ben Noach, Malkitzedek, who is the 11th generation. And you have Nimrod, the evil king, who is the 13th generation. Through Ha. Ah, Malkitzedek, because his name is... Ah, I didn't, uh, I didn't understand the question. The question was, because of his name, Malkitzedek, that Malkitzedek is Melech Yudoshan. But once more, that this is mentioned, we said the first king to be mentioned in the Torah as a king. The verse that mentions Nimrod as a king comes first, comes, comes way before. And Malkitzedek, that's what his name, what the, what the name means. But as a king figure, even as a figure, he's not represented in that way, even though his name means that. Okay, we have time for two more questions, one from each side. I think this is the best we can do. Um, I was wondering if the Rav is able to tie in um, the first known from Bereshit, the meaning of Nakash, um, so 
Is there any connection? The Naka should be played the symbol of uh, Kedva and so the question is, we have all of these, if I understand correctly, we have all of these nuns in the kings, and maybe the first big nun is the Nachash. So how does the Nachash fit in with the nun of the month of Cheshvan and all of these kings? Okay, that's a very good question. It all begins with the Nachash. It's true that every, all of this nun that we're talking about begins from Nachash. Nachash, the word Nachash in Hebrew means to, to guess. Sometimes you, a person has a, 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 a sense, a good sense of guess, like even Joseph said about himself, Nachash, Nachash, Yishash, Kamoni. There's no one that guesses better than me. To the extent that guess is, almost, a good guess is like the Holy Spirit. A good guess is like the the chush, nachash is chush, is like the chush of reach, the sense of smell that we said before, which is the messianic sense. That's why the word nachash actually equals, begemaki equals mashiach. But really it all begins from nachash. Now there's another very important thing that says about Nimrod, that Nimrod inherited the clothing of skin that God created for Adam and Eve after the sin. Those clothings went to, got to Nimrod, and afterwards Esau, Esau, actually killed Nimrod and took his clothings. Ultimately, Rebecca dressed her son Jacob with these clothings, and also, in partially in merit of those closing, he merited to the to the greatest blessings of the Torah from his father, Isaac, who loved his son Yitzchak, because he was a hunter, just like Nimrod was a hunter. So there are many things that we didn't talk about. Those clothings, that skin, is called the skin of the primordial snake. But according to Kabbalah, the clothings first, that's what first the the skin, the human skin of Adam and Eve before the sin was light. It was called Ora Hashmar. It was pure light. After the sin, once more, the sin was rebelling against the light. Then the skin became uh, all with an eye. In the, in the, in the Sefer Torah of Reb Meir, who is the Tikkun of Niron, the Tikkun of Nebuchadnezzar, the Tikkun of Nimrod, in his Sefer Torah it says, quote, not clothing of light as before the sin but in our sacred Torah it's written or with an eye which means skin but or with an eye it also means iver means blind because it's in the dark it's blind and that clothing of that skin is called mash chadachiv that's why the Targum Yonatan even says explicitly that the, the skin is the skin of the snake And that, that went to Nimrod until it was redeemed ultimately by Rebecca dressing Jacob with it, taking it from, from Esau. And thereby he merited the, the, uh, the blessings. This one's an, another tremendous uh, topic by itself. And it all begins from the Nachash, from the primordial snake. Yeah. What is the connection between Nimrod and Amalek? What is the connection between Nimrod and Amalek? Both of them, it says, about Nimrod is the first one that says that He was a, a hero, of, a hunter before God. So that before God seems positive, but he was wicked. How can, I, how can he have a positive connotation? So the sages explain that it means that he knew God and he intended to rebel against him. Yodea that same phrase in Kabbalah is, uh, is 
stated in reference to Amalek. To Amalek. Yudea Tripuno mitkaven limodbo. He knows his creator, and nonetheless he intends to rebel against him. Now Amalek, we just spoke about it, it all begins from primordial snake. Amalek is the reincarnation of the primordial snake. Amalek is the Nachasha Kadmoni. Let's try one more Gehamot, you know, just to, uh, to, to make this uh, clearer for us. Nimrod, we said that the, the basic connection that we began and, and explained is that Nimrod, the Arizal says that Nimrod is Nebuchadnezzar. So what is the value of those two names? Nimrod, we said, is 294, and Nebuchadnezzar is 422. So first of all, let's just say Nebuchadnezzar himself, which is 422. 422 equals Adam Chava Nachash. There were three participants, three players in the primordial play of the Garden of Eden. That Their names are Adam, Eve, and the serpent. Altogether, Adam, Eve, Nachash equal Nebuchadnezzar. Now, let's see what happens when we take Nebuchadnezzar, 422, and add him to Nimrod, who preceded him in time, which is 294. What, is, what do we get? 294 and 422. 7.16, correct? Divided by 2, see what the average value is. 716. What? 358. 358. Mashiach Nachash. This is the clearest Gemati identification that the common denominator of Nimrod Nebuchadnezzar is the snake himself, is the Nachash himself. But the Nachash has messianic potential. That's where all this messianic energy is here in, in, in between Nimrod and Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, last question. Nebuchadnezzar is sometimes referred to as Nebuchadnezzar. What's uh-huh. the reason for the Reish being interchanged in the Lord? Well, it's a, it's a great... So the question is that Nebuchadnezzar is also... Uh, his name is changed with, with the Reish. The question is, what is the significance of that? Now, this is a grammatical thing in, in, the, in Hebrew. First of all, there, there's another variation of the spelling of Nebuchadnezzar. He has three variations in the Tanakh. It's either, either Nebuchadnezzar, the, the kernel spelling, which is eight letters, Nun bet vav kav dalid nun sadik resh. Another important thing that we didn't mention is that many names or words customarily are shortened into one or two letters. How does Nebuchadnezzar? What is shorthand for Nebuchadnezzar? Nun nun. This is the clearest identification with the letter Nun, that the way that his name is written in short is Nun Nun. And actually we said that this, the two syllables, or the two halves of the name of Bukhanet are actually two words that are, that are put together. Nun Nun. But if we write his name in, the, in this kernel way, it comes out to be 422, as we just said. But often the name is spelled with an additional aleph. After the second nun, there's an aleph, Nebuchadnezzar. And sometimes, it's, instead of the nun, there's a raise, as you say, Nebuchadnezzar. So there are three different spellings of his name. A grammatical rule, a grammatical klal principle in, in Hebrew is that the four letters, lam and nar, lam, mem, nun, reish, are interchangeable. So in many, many words, we find this uh, phenomenon of a nun and a reish, or a nun and a lamed and a mem, all of these four letters interchange. 
obviously the difference will be the gematria. The meaning of that second word, netza, is a king. So probably in, uh, this way I would have to check, in Aramaic or in, in whatever Semitic language it is, it could be that that word itself has two forms. That either the king is the Netzar or the king is the Retzar. But that itself is because that these two letters interchange. Okay, thank you very much for coming, everyone for tuning in around the world. Again, December 3rd, Tetvav Kislev. See you then.